Okay, real quick before we start with the video. I had planned to release it earlier, but once I was done with the video and everything, I realized that, uh, so I'm using a free software. And to upload to YouTube, the software embedded this huge watermark right in the middle of the screen. And there's no way to get it off unless I buy the license, and I don't have the money for that right now. <laughs> so I am sorry. I apologize. I really didn't know that the watermark was going to be there. And I can try to find another uh, software, another video editing software. But this video is 55 minutes long already. And that's gonna take me forever. It's gonna take me forever to do it again. I legit don't want to. <laughs> I already had to redo it because my previous software went to crap. And so I just found this one and I thought that it was cool and it was so user-friendly and then it charged me money and I don't have the money to pay it right now. So it's gonna have that huge watermark stamped right in the middle of the thing. And... I apologize for that. That said, whenever I get enough money to pay for the license, I may re-upload this, or maybe I will upload it to my Patreon page, I'll figure something out, and I will let you all know. But I just wanted to say up front, hey, I am aware that this watermark is here, and I'm not like trying to pretend it's not, because it is very hard to not pay attention to it. But I just wanted to address that real quick. Hopefully it doesn't take away from much of the quality of the video. The images are going to be very, very hard to read. I am aware of that. There's not much that I can do about it right now. Whenever I re-upload it, whenever I get to purchase the license or pay for the license, whatever, then that'll be much easier to just read and overall engage with. But I... I really didn't want to wait any longer to release this because it's been since December since I released my my most recent video. So I have to do something. I have to do this so that I can continue moving on to more things. So there it is. There's the video. And other than that, I hope you enjoy it. In the year 1997, two prominent neoconservatives created an organization dedicated to advancing their vision for the United States Empire. You may know their names well. They were Bill Kristol and Robert Kagan. A year prior, they published an article arguing for a foreign policy platform in the spirit of Ronald Reagan's politics, elevating the US's place in the international arena onto one of, I kid you not, benevolent global hegemony. By this point, we already had a solid track record of deposing leaders in foreign nations and inciting regional conflicts for economic gains. But, in the eyes of these vultures, our actions around the planet throughout the 20th century weren't anywhere near our true potential. These neocons call their organization the Project for the New American Century and they assembled a range of like-minded imperialists to bring their vision into reality. Many of these newcomers would eventually make it into high positions of the Bush administration, the most notable example being former Vice President Dick Cheney. In September of the year 2000, the organization released a 90-page report titled Rebuilding America's Defenses, Strategies, Forces, and Resources for a New Century. They weren't about to waste any time. They wanted to start this new millennium at full throttle. The report gave a nod to the forever war mentality, noting that the 1990s had been a peaceful decade and arguing that no stability is everlasting, proposing that, when the next conflict broke out, the US should stand as the strongest belligerent of them all. Ensuring this, they contended, would benefit the interests of the US across the world. I'll let you decide for yourselves what that's supposed to mean. This report advocated four core principles, defending the homeland, winning multiple and simultaneous theater wars, 
shaping a security environment in specific regions and a huge revamp to the US military. To that end, they proposed gradual increases to military spending every year. There was one teensy tiny problem with all of this. There was no surefire way to sell this to the US public. We had seen major, major opposition to war efforts in previous years, and this organization understood that, for their little project to work, they needed popular support. Here's a quote from a chapter of the report, titled, Creating Tomorrow's Dominant Force, that shows this very dilemma. The process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. The allusion to Pearl Harbor is a reminder of how the attack on our coast during World War II activated civilians into massively supporting the participation of the federal government in the war. This had been a uniquely significant event given how drastically it increased the people's favorability of the military. Almost 60 years later, the organization concluded they needed something as uniquely powerful if their plan was to be realized. It took a year until the World Trade Center collapsed during the attacks on our soil by the Salafist group Al-Qaeda. This was it, our new Pearl Harbor. Now the Bush administration could rally the public into supporting its agenda for global military subjugation. I just want to be clear here. I am not saying that Bush did 9-11. What I am saying is that Bush and his minions had acknowledged a year before this catastrophe that they needed something. They expected, or at the very least, they wanted something like this to occur. Amid the confusion, the fear, and the desperation of the masses following this attack on our sovereignty, the project for the new American century carried out a systematic propaganda campaign to materialize their vision of a world dominated by a super powerful hegemonic US. In the aftermath of 9-11, George W. Bush declared his war against terrorism, signing a military order that allowed the Secretary of Defense to detain any quote-unquote aliens that the president considered to be members of Al-Qaeda, or of any terrorist group, or who had aided someone else who was a member of Al-Qaeda or of some other terrorist group. The order further created military commissions for the first time since World War II, in order to judge captured enemy combatants, forbidding them from seeking a fair trial under state or federal courts. Congress played along, passing the authorization for use of military force just a week after the attack, giving the president the authority, quote, to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons. From this point on, I'll just refer to the authorization as the AUMF. A very notable aspect of this authorization is that, rather than focusing on nation-states, as war power authorizations normally do, the AUMF targeted terrorist organizations and their supporters. With all of this, the pieces were set in motion. The president and his warmongers felt justified in their military efforts, and the public put their trust in them. From then on, they would become accountable to absolutely no one. The way they saw it, under their command, this was going to be the century the United States of America reigned supreme. It's been almost two decades since and we started this new decade with the horrifying prospect of going to war with Iran. Thankfully, the tensions have decreased, and we're pretty much back to business as usual. But why on earth should we, or the Iranian people, or anyone for that matter, have to remain vigilant 24-7 for the United States military to obliterate yet another nation? and millions of lives of its residents. Why should this be business as usual? The laughably called war on terror has been the longest armed conflict we've been in in the history of our nation. There are adults today who will vote in the upcoming election who have never lived in a US that is not at war. 
if nothing else, we have to at least agree that this is simply not how anything should be. And so, I decided I should talk a little about this. You know, from the judicial perspective, which is kind of the whole gist of this channel. As you've probably noticed by now, this video is gonna be heavier than my usual pieces. In all honesty, I really don't feel comfortable addressing a topic like this one with the tongue-in-cheek humor I try to sprinkle in my other work. I apologize in advance if that makes this more difficult to watch, but I do sincerely believe this is important and has to be said. Let's start with the first three cases the Supreme Court heard regarding the war on terror. Rumsfeld v. Padilla, Hamdi v. Rumsfeld, and Rasul v. Bush. I'm lumping these three together because they were all decided on the same day, June 28, 2004, and because they all weighed the powers of the president against the writ of habeas corpus. We briefly touched upon it in a previous video, but to recap, the writ of habeas corpus is a legal recourse that allows incarcerated persons to challenge the legitimacy of their detainment. In other words, a prisoner may invoke habeas corpus before a court of law if they have reason to believe they have been wrongfully imprisoned and, if the court is compelled, it must free the prisoner in question. It seems evident to me that habeas corpus is fundamental enough when we're talking about regular prisons. It is a grave injustice when innocent people must serve time behind bars and, for unfortunately not for all, habeas corpus does serve as a valuable medium for many fighting to get their lives back from a highly predatory justice system. But the significance of the right to habeas corpus in our conversation today is of a much greater magnitude, as we will be discussing what is arguably the closest thing there is to hell on earth, Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. Oh, so now I am going to defend criminals, huh? And not just any criminals, but the worst kind of criminals. Terrorists, huh? And not just any terrorists, but the ones who forced themselves into our homeland and killed 3,000 of our people, huh? Facetious sarcasm aside, it irks me to my core to hear the misinformation regarding Guantanamo and its detainees. Here's the fact. A report published in 2006 on the 517 detainees at Guantanamo at the time revealed that only 5% of the inmates were captured by US forces, whereas 86% were sent to us by Pakistan or the Northern Alliance, a military front in the region. An update by The Guardian in 2015 revealed that, of the 116 detainees still at Guantanamo, only three had been apprehended by the US, whereas 98 were brought to us by Pakistani spies and Afghan warlords, who I am absolutely freaking certain had zero reason whatsoever to send us any of their political enemies as a quick and dirty way to entrench their power hold in the territory. But of course, not all is politics, right? At least some of the motivation must have been to cash in the rewards of the bounties we set for their captures. Oh, because we freaking sent out wanted memos and paid money for the detainees they sent us. I cannot possibly imagine how this incentive would have resulted in us incarcerating the wrong people. Inconceivable, I say. So what? Am I going to defend the very few actual jihadists held at Guantanamo just because the methods we used to capture people were shady as heck, and innocents have undergone hell just so we could carry out the neocons' wet dream for US military supremacy? I really hope you see no need for me to answer such a ludicrous question. Going back to the cases we mentioned, the Bush administration held these detainees as unlawful enemy combatants, a label that the detainees in question contested in their lawsuits. Perhaps unsurprisingly, though still infuriatingly, the administration issued an affidavit suggesting that there was no need to investigate whether they really were enemy combatants and that the very fact that they were labeled as such by government officials was in and of itself enough to deny them the writ of habeas corpus. You see the problem here? Now, 
If you're familiar with the vocabulary of military detention, you may have noticed that we are not referring to these inmates as prisoners of war. This was very much deliberate, as prisoners of war would have been entitled to the protections established by the Third Geneva Convention. Lawful enemy combatants under international law must receive the same treatment as other prisoners of war, but since our detainees were categorized as the unlawful kind, they were denied the POW status so we wouldn't have to abide by those pesky humanitarian concerns. As to how the Bush administration got away with this, they merely argued that the detainees were Al-Qaeda men, and that Al-Qaeda was not a state party to the Geneva Conventions. So... Screw the rules, we have the most powerful military in the world. Oh, and let there be not a shadow of a doubt that Guantanamo was chosen precisely because of the legal black hole it represented. It's not on US soil, and the prisoners are not protected by US laws, making this place a free-for-all when it comes to human rights abuses. Yeah, I am saddened to announce that this was not an oopsie. With that in mind, the reason these lawsuits were issued in 2004 was precisely because as pointed out by senior U.S. Circuit Court Judge A. Wallace Tashima, the proper mechanisms for these inmates to contest their imprisonment were not created until 2004, years after many of them had been captured. And even then, the way the Supreme Court handled these cases was quite mediocre at best. Let's start with Rumsfeld v. Padilla. Jose Padilla was arrested in O'Hare International Airport in Chicago after returning home from Pakistan in 2002. An important detail, Padilla is a US citizen. He was born and raised in Brooklyn, keep that in mind. He had been detained as a material witness for an investigation on Al-Qaeda, but Bush administration officials later changed his status to enemy combatant and transferred him from civilian incarceration into military detention, with no access to an attorney, or anyone in the outside world, really. The FBI then stated that Padilla had returned to the States to engage in domestic terrorism. Padilla was forced to wait until 2004 to challenge his imprisonment. His lawsuit claimed that the administration officials had overstepped their authority under the AUMF, as Padilla was protected by the Non-Detention Act. Inspired by the Japanese internment camps established during World War II, the NDA held that no citizen shall be imprisoned or otherwise detained by the United States except pursuant to an act of Congress. Since Congress had not ordered the capture of Padilla, his detainment was illegal. The case reached the Supreme Court, which didn't resolve the question. For some godforsaken reason, the Supreme Court decided to focus on how the case was filed rather than actually addressing the problem. As a norm, petitions for habeas writs tend to be filed against the person who imprisoned the victim. In the case of Padilla, this person was the commander of the military brig where he was being detained but the lawsuit was filed against then-Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld. Also, the lawsuit was filed in New York, but the commander lived in South Carolina. Based on these errors, the lawsuit was dismissed. Let me repeat that. The details in the lawsuit were technically incorrect, so the whole thing was thrown away. Justice. As explained by Owen Fess, Sterling Professor Emeritus at Yale Law School, the point of this norm is to prevent prisoners from forum shopping, the process of actively looking for a court that is likely to rule in their favor. This is not a rule set in stone, though, and exceptions had been made in the past. The dissenting justices in the case even brought that up, claiming that the transfer from civilian to military authorities was such a unique circumstance that there was no reason not to make an exception this time as well but Chief Justice William Rehnquist didn't give a reason. He simply refused to concede, and ordered Padilla to submit a corrected suit because apparently procedure is more important than addressing human suffering. Good work, folks. Padilla refiled, and the wait started over. While the lower courts were deciding whether the AUMF authorized the government to hold US citizens with zero evidence or not, 
the feds decided to shift him back from military into civilian detention, abandoning the supposed connection with Al-Qaeda and instead charging him with conspiracy to murder, kidnap, and maim. Given that the government wasn't pursuing the military charges anymore, the Supreme Court decided not to hear the case against Padilla's military detention, again throwing everything into the dumpster. To this day, Padilla remains in solitary confinement in Colorado. Our next case is Hamdi v. Rumsfeld. Yasser Hamdi was one of the detainees originally captured by the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan and then sent to Guantanamo. According to his father, Hamdi was in the region doing relief work. When officials found that Hamdi was a US citizen from Louisiana, they transferred him to a naval brig in Virginia. Like Padilla, Hamdi was kept in solitary confinement for years, even though he had not been charged with any crimes. Also like Padilla, when Hamdi contested his detainment in 2004, the Bush administration retorted that he had no rights to habeas corpus, given that he had been categorized as an enemy combatant. On appellation, the fourth court ruled in favor of the Bush administration, finding that Hamdi had been captured on foreign soil and that the detention was lawful under the AUMF concluding that the judicial branch should not interfere with the work of the other branches during wartime. The Supreme Court then took the case with two questions to resolve. First, can the Bush administration hold a US citizen captured outside the US as an enemy combatant? And second, can Hamdi resort to the judicial branch to challenge his detainment? On the first question, the court sided with the government agreeing that the AUMF gave Bush the power to detain even US citizens as enemy combatants. On the second question, the court tried to find a balance in the middle, concluding that Hamdi did have a right to habeas corpus, but allowing for significant restrictions to his Fifth Amendment due process guarantees, including being tried by a military judge, which, if you ask me, kinda misses the point of the whole fact that he should not have been in military detention to begin with. In the end, the administration released him on the condition that he renounce his US citizenship, after which they deported him to Saudi Arabia. The last of our three cases is Rasul v. Bush, and this is the one in which the administration pushed the hardest. The Rasul case involved a group of non-US citizens, two Australians and 12 Kuwaitis, whose constitutional protections were by definition much more limited than Padilla's and Hamdi's. These people were reportedly in the region for personal or humanitarian reasons. At one point, two British people were also lumped in, but they were released following strong diplomatic pressure. Whereas in the previous cases, the Feds referred to the detainee's status as enemy combatants to demand a dismissal of the writs of habeas corpus, the administration in Rasul claimed that these foreigners with no US citizenship had no constitutional basis to even invoke the raid in the first place. The decision of the Supreme Court on this one was... Um, messy. The court pretty much affirmed that the detainees had a right to invoke the writ, but didn't really clarify what other rights they had or not under the US Constitution. Furthermore, the habeas corpus right that the court upheld was based on the federal habeas statute, not on the constitution itself, which leaves open the question of just how authoritative their suits can be realistically. The only thing we can reasonably take from Rasul is that detainees who are not US citizens may petition for a writ of habeas corpus, but other than the ability to petition it, there are no guarantees. The Bush administration had argued that, given the restrictions of the statute, prisoners could only petition for writs within their jurisdictions. Since the detainees were at Guantanamo, however, there was no court in their jurisdiction to which they could petition for a writ. The Supreme Court caught this little trick and ruled that federal district courts could indeed hear these cases, contrary to the claims of the administration. After all, the detainees were in a United States base, so there was no other government they could have appealed to other than the United States government. Even if there was a court abroad to hear their plea, they could not have enforced their findings against the US government, 
so any such efforts would have been for nothing either way. Writing for the majority, Justice John Paul Stevens acknowledged that for the writ to have value, the damages must violate the Constitution. And for the detainees' constitutional rights to be violated, they have to have constitutional rights. But detainees who are not US citizens and who are technically not in the US do not have constitutional rights. So we reach an impasse here. In the 15th footnote of Stevens' opinion, the justice enumerated five conditions that would indicate the unconstitutionality of the detainees, whether the detainees were enemy combatants, whether they had been detained for more than two years, whether they were in an area long controlled exclusively by the US government, whether they had access to counsel, and whether they had been charged with any crimes. As Fez argues, not only are these criteria too vague to be interpreted uniformly, but they fail to clarify what rights detainees may or may not invoke, and it leaves detainees outside the US unprotected. Think Abu Ghraib. Stevens ended this footnote by referencing United States v. Verdugo Urquides, a case from 1990 that has influenced much of modern-day judicial thought on the actions of government agents abroad. This case revolved around a Mexican citizen living in a Mexican town whose home was searched by the DEA, a US agency. The DEA had gotten authorization by the Mexican government, but not by the US. Based on that, Verdugo Urquides filed a suit arguing that the actions of the DEA violated the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the DEA arguing that the rights enshrined in the Constitution are meant to protect the people, meaning Americans, and did not apply to aliens. Chief Justice Rehnquist justified this position by basically arguing that, in order to safeguard our national interests, the Bill of Rights should not impair US military operations in other countries. I find this to be preposterous. There is much debate about the extent to which people who are not US citizens are entitled to US constitutional rights. I'm of the belief that they should be, but that's neither here nor there. The thing here is that Rehnquist created a distinction between citizens and aliens that has nothing to do with the constitutional restriction on governmental activities set by the Fourth Amendment. Namely, that officers can't just simply enter your house and take your stuff to use against you in court. I just don't see how this is debatable in any way, shape, or form. How else could anyone in Verdugo Orquides' position defend themselves when our government oversteps its boundaries? It isn't quite clear why Stevens mentioned the Verdugo Orquides case but he ignored Rehnquist's majority opinion and referenced Justice Anthony Kennedy's concurrence instead. Maybe this was a move to get Kennedy to join his interpretation in Rasul, but Kennedy ended up writing his own opinion instead. Whatever the case, the court agreed that the Guantanamo detainees could demand a habeas corpus proceeding, but failed to clarify exactly what rights they were entitled to in said proceedings. But even with all their faults, the Bush administration took these rulings as a sign that it had to consolidate its military machine even further, investing special effort in rolling back whatever few liberties the court had affirmed for the detainees. Just a couple of weeks after the rulings, Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz created the Combatant Status Review Tribunals, or CSRTs, and bestowed upon them responsibility over the detainees, which would normally have been a duty for the courts. The intention of this move was evident. Civilian courts would treat the detainees with a minimum degree of respect, so they should be tried by specialized military officers instead as enemies of the state. Tashima described the CSRTs thusly. In lieu of an attorney, the detainee is assigned a military officer as a personal representative. The detainee can access only the unclassified evidence that supports his designation as an enemy combatant and may attend proceedings only when testimony would not compromise national security. 
the detainee may call only those witnesses that the tribunal deems reasonably available. Witnesses who are members of the U.S. Armed Forces are deemed unavailable if their commanders determine their presence would affect combat operations. Unsworn statements and hearsay, including evidence obtained by torture, are admissible as evidence. Finally, the order establishes a rebuttal of omission in favor of the government's evidence, institutes a preponderance of evidence standard, and requires the majority vote of the three officers who sit on the tribunal to deem the detainee an enemy combatant. If the CESRT concludes that the detainee is not an enemy combatant, the government may seek repeated hearings before other CSRT tribunals until it succeeds. We don't know how most trials in CSRTs go because that information is classified. You know, because learning how federal officials treat incarcerated people would compromise our national interests. By the end of 2005, Congress passed and Bush signed the Detainee Treatment Act, setting up interrogation procedures, limiting civil and criminal liability for the interrogators, and amending the federal habeas corpus statute to prevent courts from extending the writ to Guantanamo detainees once and for all. Notably though, this correction did not affect the right to habeas corpus found in the Constitution. Before the DTA was signed into law, however, detainee Salim Hamden had petitioned for a habeas writ. Hamden was the chauffeur of Osama bin Laden, and he was being held at Guantanamo. While his petition was being processed, a military tribunal designated him an enemy combatant. The writ was eventually granted by a district court after the passage of the Detainee Treatment Act, ruling that Hamdan should have had a hearing to determine whether he was a prisoner of war as defined by the Geneva Convention before being subjected to a military tribunal. The case, Hamdan v. Rumsfeld, ultimately reached the Supreme Court which had to resolve whether Hamden's writ was valid given that he had petitioned for it before the DTA was made into law, or if it was invalid because the writ was granted too late, and whether US courts are even capable of enforcing the Geneva Convention, as those are matters of international law, and the federal courts normally deal with constitutional law instead. The Bush administration took the position that the writ was invalid, because of course it did, did anyone really expect otherwise? The court disagreed. In his majority opinion, Justice Stevens pointed out that Congress had argued against retroactive application of the act. He then accused the administration of obfuscating the facts and ruled the military tribunals unconstitutional on the grounds that the Constitution conferred neither Congress nor the President with the power to establish them. Congress, according to the court, had only the power to authorize military commissions in compliance with the Uniform Code of Military Justice, but both the Code and the Geneva Conventions were violated in the military trial of Hamden. Unfortunately, the court did not answer whether the DTA forbade federal courts from hearing habeas petitions in the future. Again, the Bush administration took this as a call to double down, or triple down by now, I guess. Either way. Congress passed the Military Commissions Act in the fall of 2006. With it, Congress explicitly authorized for the first time the trial of unlawful enemy combatants before military tribunals. Additionally, the MCA established a military appellate tribunal called the Court of Military Commission Review, with judges appointed by the Secretary of Defense. On top of all this, the MCA amended the federal habeas statute one, by eliminating the specific references to Guantanamo detainees, thus making it applicable to all quote-unquote enemy combatants both in and outside of Guantanamo, and two, by making it apply retroactively, invalidating all the petitions pending on the court's dockets. It was clearly meant to override the Supreme Court's decision in Hamden, and it would take well over a year before a proper challenge to it made it to the judiciary. The plaintiff this time were Lakdar Boumedien and five other Algerians, captured by the Bosnian police and sent to Guantanamo in 2002. As to why we were detaining people in Bosnia when our war was supposedly in Afghanistan and Iraq, your guess is as good as mine. The group had filed a habeas petition in 2004, 
claiming that their detainment violated the Constitution's due process clause, several statutes and treaties, the common law, and international law, but lower courts dismissed it due to it being aliens. This was before the Supreme Court established that non-US citizens do have habeas rights in Rasul v. Bush, at least a statutory right, if not a constitutional right. Which is meh, but is still better than nothing, I guess. The group tried again, and their suit was reconsidered in 2006, after the passage of the MCA. They argued that the MCA violated the suspension clause, but the appeals court didn't buy it, referring to originalist principles to determine that the clause must be understood as an 18th century artifact, not applicable to the detainee's current situation. Then the suit got to the Supreme Court. In Boumedien v. Bush, the court found that the MCA was actually a violation of the suspension clause of the Constitution, as it attempted to take away the court's jurisdiction over habeas petitions filed from Guantanamo. The court then affirmed that detainees do have constitutional habeas corpus rights, a much more concrete response than what they had given before in Rasul. So also by invoking originalism, the court concluded that the framers of the Constitution considered habeas corpus to be a right of first importance, and that the laws of Congress ought not violate this essential premise. Ironically enough, Antonin Scalia, the patron saint of originalism, dissented, holding that puritanically subscribing to the text would risk our national security. Quote, the game of bait and switch that today's opinion plays upon the nation's commander-in-chief will make the war harder on us. It will almost certainly cause more Americans to be killed. That consequence would be tolerable if necessary to preserve a time-honored legal principle vital to our constitutional republic. Oh, how the turns have tabled. But all of that barely scratches the surface of war on terror jurisprudence in much of which there's been virtually nothing but silence from the Supreme Court, and not for a lack of cases. Just to cite some instances, the court refused to review a case concerning an innocent man beaten, drugged, and imprisoned by the CIA for the sake of protecting state secrets. It ignored a suit against Boeing subsidiaries due to their involvement in the extraordinary rendition program. It dismissed a challenge to a decision by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of Review validating the constitutionality of the Patriot Act. And it won't even defend its own ruling in Boumedien when lower courts undermine it. It was already bad enough when the court tried to find some milk-toast golden mean between the rights written in the Constitution and the Bush administration's war machine but I have no words to describe the shamelessness in rejecting the responsibility to rein in the actions of the other branches in all these years. A very notable example of this, to me at least, was ACLU v. NSA. Here, the American Civil Liberties Union was fighting to abolish the terrorist surveillance program, which gave the National Security Agency the capacity to track millions of phone calls within the US without a warrant. The lower courts ruled against the ACLU on procedural grounds, claiming that they were not directly affected by the program and therefore had no grounds to sue. The ACLU appealed the case to the Supreme Court, which declined to hear it without explanation. And then we have the very bad decisions, such as Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project, in which the court decided that Congress could criminalize any form of material support to terrorist organizations. This includes pretty much anything the state can possibly use to accuse anyone of supporting terrorism, from actual service to things like non-violent advocacy. Yeah, I surely trust them not to abuse that, I say, sarcastically. I don't believe I need to go too much into detail on how US forces have very heavily tortured detainees under their custody. Not only has this behavior been pervasive, but it's even been encouraged by those at the tippy-top of the chain of command. Remarkably, the Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel authorized several memoranda back in 2002 explaining to officials how to avoid being charged with war crimes while engaging in so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. They didn't use the word torture because, well, the Geneva Conventions, so they framed it as an interrogation. 
that had been enhanced with tour Even though, at least in my personal impression, the war on terror has not received as much attention in recent years as it did at its onset, and that in and of itself merits its own discussion about the normalization of the US war apparatus, our nation's capital and human investment in military efforts abroad has increased exponentially in the past decade. By the year 2017, the authorization for use of military force had been utilized over 30 times to justify our military interventions in at least 10 different countries. Obama used it to invade Syria and Iraq without congressional approval in 2016, and there were discussions some months ago about whether the Trump administration would invoke it to attempt to start a war with Iran by linking them to Al-Qaeda. And, of course, how to forget one of the most lauded warfare technologies of our generation, combat drones. Along with so many other atrocities, the Obama administration relied on the powers conferred until his office by the AUMF, among other statutes to be fair, to abuse the crap out of the drone program which by now has killed anywhere between 8,000 and 12,000 people, including at least 700 civilians, possibly up to 1,700. And keep in mind that who counts as a civilian and who doesn't depends heavily on who does the reporting and what political motives they have to choose either category. Considering how loosely the administration has defined supposed enemy combatants, I'd be very skeptical of the lower numbers. Well, that and the fact that the US government only admits a small fraction of all the death they produce in these operations, which muddies the waters even further. A court case about this comes to mind, though it never made it to the Supreme Court. In 2012, the ACLU and the Center for Constitutional Rights sued the Obama administration's killing of three US citizens because the government can kill its own citizens now so long as it labels them as enemies first, in drone strikes in Yemen. So, did they deserve it? First of all, we'll never know, as they never stood trial. They simply got killed by the drone, and that was the end of it. There is some publicly available background information, so we can only go based on that. From what we know, the federal government accused Anwar Alolaki of being a global terrorist in 2010. It seems he was a member of Al-Qaeda and, although he was a US citizen, he was hiding in Yemen. He was located by US officials in 2011 and killed alongside Samir Khan, a North Carolinian he was meeting with and who was not in any kill lists kept by the Obama administration. The US military has the discretion to kill combatants extrajudicially when in war zones. Alolaki and Khan, however, were not in one at the time of the strike. But the administration brushed that tiny little detail off as irrelevant. Two weeks later, administration officials ordered drone strikes against Alolaki's 16-year-old son, Abdul Rahman Alolaki, born in Denver, Colorado. The operation was completed when Abdul Rahman was eating dinner with his teenage cousin, who also died in the attack, as well as other innocents in the restaurant whom US officials wrote off as collateral damage. When pressed about the administration's reasons to kill these children, White House Press Secretary Robert Gibbs merely stated that Abdul Rahman should have had a more responsible father. These people are sociopaths. A different suit, also by the ACLU and the CCR, argued that these killings violated the Fourth and Fifth Amendments to the Constitution. As I said previously, none of these made it to the Supreme Court, but the lower courts dismissed the suits, affirmed that the Obama administration's actions did not violate the Constitution, and pointed out that, even if they had violated it, there were no remedies under current US law. The latest development in the Alolaki tragedy came from a commando raid carried out by the Navy SEALs Team 6 and authorized by Donald Trump in 2017 that ended in the killing of 30 innocents, including 8-year-old Nawar Alolaki, Abdul Rahman's little sister and, wouldn't you know it, also a US citizen by birth. 
Despite the popular resistance inspired by these and other abuses of power by the executive abroad, drone strikes not only continue to this day, but the Trump administration has increased Obama's already absurd amount of strikes. Oh, and following up from the whole no remedies under US law thingy, still not a thing. I guess it's not as much of a priority as one would hope. What you gonna do? In looking for newer cases, I found that the Supreme Court continued to deny hearings to Guantanamo detainees as recently as last year. I want you to really think about this. There are people who were captured in 2001 who are still, to this day, in Guantanamo. And the courts give them no recourse to even hope that they'll get out one day. People born in 2001 are legal adults now. That's how much time has passed. That's how long some human beings have remained trapped in cells the size of a bathroom. Please, for crying out loud, this has to end ASAP. And the range of people antagonized by the war on terror goes well beyond alleged enemy combatants and their supposed material supporters. Even beyond the Patriot Act and the NSA's massive surveillance of everyone inhabiting the US, these efforts have allowed the administration, in great measure, to silence political dissent. Empowered by the Freedom of Information Act, journalists have sought to disclose governmental actions to the public in a consistent and timely manner. Or, at least, that's how it was until Obama took office and found a new use for the 1917 Espionage Act as a tool to crack down on voices challenging the US's military supremacy. And I probably don't need to add this, but as you may imagine, Trump has gone even harder down this route in his never-ending enterprise of being an even worse president than his predecessor. One case that stood out to me is that of James Risen, then a reporter for the New York Times, currently the senior national security correspondent for The Intercept. He rose to popularity by writing pieces about the Bush administration's domestic wiretapping program and would later write other articles based on the documents leaked by national hero Edward Snowden. More relevant to our talk, Risen published in 2006 his book titled State of War, The Secret History of the CIA and the Bush Administration, in which he spoke about, among other things, a CIA plan to sabotage the Iranian Republic's nuclear program as explained by an anonymous source. In 2008, the Bush administration subpoenaed him to find out who his source was, but he cited his First Amendment rights and refused to comply. Reason waited for the subpoena to expire, but Obama renewed it in 2010. By 2014, Reason's case got to the Supreme Court, which did nothing. The administration finally let go of the whole ordeal in 2015. The experience led Reason to qualify the Obama administration as the greatest enemy of press freedom that we have encountered in at least a generation. I am sure that many of you are familiar with the cases of Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Reality Winner, and so many others whom executive officials want to punish for the horrendous crime of telling us what our government is up to. I wanted to highlight the story of Risen today, however, because at this point we're not talking about a leaker serving our armed ranks and bound to military rules, but a journalist who was fulfilling his duty by reporting stories to the public which the government disapproved of. It is already bad enough that whistleblowers have to endure any of this, but the risks are sort of expected to come with the job, even if they shouldn't. But when reporters who speak truth to power must also fear this level of retaliation. We know that there is something horribly wrong going on behind the curtain, something that our officials are desperate to keep in the dark. And the saddest thing is that, by and large, this relentless intimidation campaign has worked. Fewer and fewer journalists support releasing information without prior government authorization, instead working as propaganda pieces for the administration. Where is the justice when we are forbidden from learning what our armed force and intelligence agencies do at home and abroad? Where is the justice when journalists, 
who dare to defy the official narrative fear for their safety, not from some rogue undercover group, but from our very own system. Where is the justice when we can extrajudicially detain anyone from anywhere for years, possibly even decades, while blocking every recourse they could use to defend themselves? Where is the justice when we can kill little children because they should have had a more responsible father? Where is the justice when we are forced to give up our constitutional rights in the name of national security while the highest court in the land, the ultimate arbiter of the law, refuses to hear any challenges to the government's actions? Why is this the new normal? Stephen Vladek, Dalton Cross Professor at the University of Texas School of Law, points out that all of this has been justified by an increasingly dominant view of constitutional interpretation, one holding that the liberties listed in the Constitution are secondary to the principle of separation of powers. In other words, that whatever evils have been brought upon us by the war on terror are only the ones resulting from one branch of our government interfering with the functions of another branch, and that so long as this separation is respected, the administration should be free to do whatever it considers necessary to accomplish its goals. Whether liberty for the sake of liberty matters is debatable. The important thing according to this view is that our national interests matter more either way. In fact, this may explain why the Supreme Court has been so skittish about taking cases challenging the war on terror. Heck! It even explains why its decisions were so mediocre for the cases they did take. It's not about the merits of the military operations. It's not even about protecting civil liberties. It's all about respecting the other branches and ensuring that they don't break protocol while destroying people's lives. Thankfully, there's been some good, or at least decent, rulings coming from the lower courts in recent years including decisions striking down parts of the No-Fly List, the Patriot Act, and the FBI's terrorism watch list. It's not great, certainly nowhere near as much as is needed, but I also didn't want to end without at least mentioning these modest gains. Still, there's much more work to do. Unfortunately, we don't see the fervor and persistence in opposing these wars that we saw for other armed conflicts like Vietnam. The reason for this lies in the different conditions of both contexts. Back then was the height of the civil rights movement. The public was distrustful of their government and thought that taking to the streets was the best way to voice their concerns and produce political change. Our military efforts were rightly seen as a show of force against sovereign nations that had done nothing against us, which led to strong direct action against military recruitment programs, something that was all the more exacerbated by the implementation of the draft. Multiple forms of state violence against the protesters only legitimized their movement in the popular imagination. We are working within a very different framework today. Most prominently, we have become utterly atomized in recent decades, as the importance of communities has relented and capitalistic individualism has been brought to the forefront of our culture. As a result, we have forgotten our collective strength and gotten too accustomed to see change through individual consumer habits, like fighting racism by buying Nike shoes because they released that commercial that one time or trying to stop climate change by using less water and throwing away our old yellow lights for new white lights. We have been reprogrammed to think of our power in market terms, and there's not much we can do about the war on terror this way. At best, we can wait until the next election and try to vote for the person least likely to preserve the status quo. If that doesn't work, then we wait another four years for the next election, and so on. We also cannot discount just how deeply 9-11 has been carved into our nation's memory. To many in the US, the war on terror is a legitimate effort to prevent future attacks against our people, even with all the damage we do to their people. They think of it as self-defense, even though our response has been very suspiciously selective, but this may also be the reason why our military hasn't felt it necessary to revive the draft, 
inarguably one of the most controversial moves during the Vietnam War era. There's more than enough people joining the military under the spell of honorably serving and protecting their nation, so there is no need to force civilians into it. Of course, there's also many joining the military because they have no other choice if they want to survive in this inhumanely predatory economy. Whatever the reason, the military is doing well as far as recruiting people goes. And while state violence against its people is still a thing, the previous factors have compounded to nullify this one as well. When protests against violence do occur, they are often performative or very locally contained. The spark that ignites nationwide outrage doesn't seem to be there anymore. Instead, the protests of the present are heavily shaped by a model of the core. We are allowed to disagree about the value of human lives so long as we do it respectfully and civilly. We don't have to build networks and organize direct action. All we really need for the protests of the present is to gather, march, and disband. And maybe we'll do it again the following year. Possibly, if we can find someone to cover our shift at work. Because that's also a huge reason we can't organize anymore. We are overworked and underpaid. We are poor and restrained by debt. Standing for what's right is important, but I gotta feed my family first. And perhaps the biggest factor explaining why we let all this continue is that, well, it's just how things are now, I guess. US troops killing civilians in the Middle East? Sure, that's natural. People in the US being constantly surveilled by intelligence agencies as our information is stored in giant facilities? Yeah, it's called Tuesday. Torturing Guantanamo and however many other black sites we run around the world? Oh yeah, those exist. All of this we just kinda take for granted at this point. It's the way of things, the normal state of affairs. When do we get out of the region? We oh, don't get out. So this is not to say that all is lost though. There are some anti-war organizations hard at work, albeit weakened by all the systemic constraints making this endeavor so incredibly difficult to achieve. I encourage you to check them out and lend them a hand if you're able. I don't think all of them are still active, but we can still use the ones that are. I mean it when I say that we have got to put an end to this neoconservative power fantasy and the horrible affront to humanity it represents. That's all I have for today. And freaking heck, that was a lot. I hope you appreciated this video. And please share it if you believe that others could benefit from hearing any of this. I want to give a shout out to Sigil's Mistakes and 333 for lending me their voices for this piece. I left links to their amazing work in the description box, so go give them some love. I won't BS you, I don't know how long it'll take me to release my next video. I guess it all depends on how long it ends up being. This one was complicated, so it's probably gonna be an outlier rather than the norm, but we'll see. If you want to support me, I have linked my Patreon and Coffee accounts in the description box. It would help me a lot. Thank you so much for making it this far with me and thank you for patiently waiting for this one to come out. Remember to subscribe and ring the bell if you want to be notified of my future content, and to like and comment to help me out with the algorithm. And uh, that's all, I think. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I will see you back here in the next one. Stay safe.